Hello, thinkers. Today, we're tackling a topic that's more critical than ever before, your financial future. Because let's face it, money matters big time. But navigating the world of personal finance can feel like decoding secret language, all jargon, no answers. So we're going to break that jargon down, give you tips to build your fortune. Just clear talk, actionable steps, and a healthy dose of let's demystify this beast. So a little bit about me before we continue. I am, well, I was, I should say, a wealth manager. I used to work for a company called Merrill Lynch. Uh, for a few years, I had my own financial consulting company. I no longer have my licenses. I am going to give you general advice because I do not know your personal finances. So do not consider this as personal advice. I'm supposed to say that. Uh, do speak to a professional regarding your own financial needs. However, I'm going to try my best. So without further ado, let's get... Do me a favor, hit that like, share, subscribe, give me five stars or a thumbs up, share this content, it really helps the platform out and will spread this message to all your friends and family. Now, first things first, I think it's important for you to understand that what I'm about to give you in this episode takes years of practice and mastery and to even get the license is extremely difficult to do what, um, what I'm explaining to you. So I need to give you a summary of this before we get into our three big breakdowns. So we're going to talk about your financial foundation and imagine your life like a skyscraper when it comes to finance. Income, your paychecks, is the bedrock holding everything up. Expenses, rent, groceries, that Netflix subscription as the bricks and mortar shaping your space. Debt, well, that's the heavy, the, the leaky pipe in the basement, something to tackle head on. Now, not all debt is bad, and I'll get to that momentarily. Next, budgeting, the blueprint for your financial castle. Think of it like splitting a pizza. You can do 50% to take needs like rent and bills, 30% to wants like concerts and gadgets, and 20% tucked away for future upgrades. Now, this is not set in stone. I know a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck, and I will get to that too. Here's the deal. In order for you to build that bigger castle, you're going to have to do some sacrifices. Ideally, you want that 50, 30, 20, but being a realist myself, I know that is not always the case. So don't worry, we'll get to that. Now, here's the budgeting philosophies. Zero-based envelope system, whatever you name it, you know, that's more of the hard line like cash. The point is to finding a system that clicks for you and sticking to it. Your personal fitness plan for financial health. Six weeks to build a habit, it has to be consistent. So make sure you're consistent. Now, let's talk growing your cash. Investing 101. Imagine throwing spare change into a magic piggy bank that multiplies. That's kind of like investing. We'll explore different types of investment from stocks and bonds to mutual funds and ETFs, helping you build a diverse portfolio like record collections spanning from Beethoven to Beyonce. Remember, risk tolerance is key. Not everyone wants to do backflips of financial high wire, and we'll help you find that answer that that sweet spot between cautious and adventurous. Building a portfolio that matches your comfort level. Responsible investing is also in the spotlight because making money shouldn't cost the planet to you. So this is a journey. Thinkers, it's not a race. There will be stumbles, detours, and maybe even financial flat tires or two. But the beauty is you're the driver. You can adjust, learn, and evolve as you go. So grab your notebook, open your minds, and join me in this adventure.
One, budgeting your finances. You have to pick your weapon, explore different budgeting methods like the 50-30-20 rule that I mentioned to you earlier, or you can use cash envelopes. You have to decide what resonates with you and your lifestyle. For me, I don't need a 50-30-20. I can do other ways. I usually do, because of children, I have about, um, I would say, um, approximately 80 uh, 10 10 and I'll get to that in a moment so the 50 30 20 rule 50 percent is the needs your rent your groceries your utilities your transportations the essentials that keep your life running then there's the wants that's the 30 percent entertainment dining out hobby subscriptions the treats that add flavor of your days that's Personally, for me, that's 10% because I am easily amused. I'm always reading. I'm always working. I'm always with the kids, but I'm, all, I'm usually home. That's, I'm a homebody type of person. That doesn't have to mean you are too, um, but you have to adjust accordingly. You have to know your budget. Then there's that 20% savings. For me, it's 10%. Uh, emergency fund, investment, debt repayment, your future fortress bricks. Okay, so let me give you an example. So we'll say Sarah earns 4000 monthly. Using the 50-30-20 rule, she allocates needs $2,000. That's rent, grocery, and bills. That is not for everyone. Maybe Sarah has a roommate. We don't know her financial situation. I'm giving you an example. Wants, 1200 That's for eating out, movies, gym membership. Again, would I adjust it if I was her financial advisor? Absolutely. I would say instead of a gym membership, maybe you should just buy some equipment to have at home and just motivate yourself to work out. And there you will save some money. Savings, $800 for emergency fund and retirement account. I would probably, in her situation, I would bump that a little bit up more because we want to save. Uh, this is where I'm putting on my dad hat or what have you, uh, former financial consulting. You want three to six months of savings. Anything over that is technically you're losing money. And I'll get to that in a moment. Here's some tips regarding budgeting. Track your expenses for a month to understand your current spending habits. Use budget budgeting apps or spreadsheets to categorize your spending and visualize your progress. And finally, be flexible with the percentages. Maybe you need more for rent or less for dining out. Adjust based on your situation. Now, what I was saying earlier about why you're wasting money is because the way, at least in the United States, and I know I have a lot of listeners overseas, I am sorry, just bear with me, this will be brief. Once you receive a certain amount of interest rate um, in a bank, they are taxed. They're taxed federally, and they will be taxed possibly locally. So then you have to calculate inflation. So once you have inflation, the taxes that come out, you're actually becoming, you're getting on a negative. If you are... Um, risk a very high risk, um, excuse me, low risk tolerant, meaning you do not want to take huge risks. You know, you're somewhere in the um, uh, in the range where you're starting to plan retirement. You may want to look into triple tax free debt bonds, if you will. By doing that, you after you have your emergency fund, what it'll have its growth, the extra funds. But at the same time, it won't create major tax issues for you later on. So this is something to consider. When you are doing any type of short-term or long-term investments, you have to look at inflation. You have to look at uh, taxes, your tax bracket. And you have to look at the rates. And do they correlate? CDs that they sell in banks are the worst product you can possibly buy, in my opinion. The reason why is because they'll give you, if you're lucky, 1% to 2%. Meanwhile, 
you have inflation, I believe is at 6% right now. And then you have to calculate taxes from the interest you've earned. And then there's your tax bracket. So again, I do not know your situation. If it was right in front of me, I'll be able to give you a better idea, but speak to a consultant, um, accountant, and what have you. Now, let's go on to another tip that you can possibly do for your budget. Think of your paycheck as a mission objective. Every dollar has a job to do before it reaches your wallet. So, an example, Alex receives 3500 He assigns every dollar to specific expenses, debt payments, or saving goals until the entire amount is allocated, meaning going to zero. So, how to do that? Here's some tips. List all your income and expenses for the month. Assign every dollar to a category until the total reaches zero. So you have a certain amount of dollars in your rent and bills and what have you. You have a certain amount of dollars in entertainment. And then you calculate whatever you have for savings and investments. Calculate it and it has to reach zero. Assign every dollar to a category until the total reaches zero. You have to do that. I'm I'm overemphasizing it. But there's a point to that. And you can use apps like, um, oh, I don't know how to say it, but I'm just going to do the acronym for it. It's a YNAB or every dollar to simplify this process. And be prepared to adjust your allocations as needed. Another tip is cash envelopes. This is old school. This hands-on approach uses physical envelopes to manage different spending categories. Allocate cash to each envelope at the beginning of the month and stick to it. So here's an example. Maria uses envelopes for groceries, gas, uh, fun money, and bills. Once the cash is in, in the envelope runs out, the category is done for the month. So choose a realistic amount for each envelope based on your budget. Carry a separate wallet for your envelopes to avoid dipping into other funds. Another tip is use different colors or labels to identify each envelope easily. And you can track this. Download budgeting apps like Mint or the YNAB or stick to a good old-fashioned spreadsheet. Log your income and expenses for a month to get a clear picture of your cash flow. Another tip is identify sneaky expenses like hidden subscriptions or impulse buys. Challenge yourself to reduce those outflows by setting your saving goals and reward yourself. Celebrate milestones. Hitting your savings target for a month, treat yourself to that concert ticket you've been, in, you've been eyeing. Remember, the best budgeting method is the one you can stick with. Experiment, tweak, and find what works best for you financially. The key is to be intentional with your money and build a plan that puts you in control. Two, investing for beginners. Before we get into this step in particular, uh, I want to demystify some of the jargon and give you straight definition so that when you are listening to this part, you understand where I am coming from and that we're all on the same page. So in the most simplest explanation, stocks are shares of a company. Basically, you become part owner. The value goes up or down based on several factors, um, which different types of analysis, which I will not get into but it's just what traders deem it's worth. Bonds are debt you buy from other organizations. You become Visa or MasterCard. You buy a bond, and the bond is what the debt is. How much the company will pay you in interest and the promise to pay you back from the original debt you give them. People can also trade bonds, and their prices can fluctuate based on their rate and the cost. So, in other words, if you borrow, excuse me, if you buy a bond at $1,000 and it has an interest rate, and I'm just throwing some numbers out there of 5%, guess what? They have to pay you 5% of of the promised 
term of the bond, whatever that is, could be five years, could be 10 years, got to pay you 5%. And then at the end, when it matures or for some of you expire, they have to pay you back that original $1,000. So you got that 5% and the additional $1,000. Lastly, mutual funds. It's a portfolio of a variety of stocks and bonds that are managed by a manager. You pay a fee to get into these funds and in return, someone will manage the mutual fund and they have a financial fiduciary responsibility to make sure that fund is successful and reaching its goals. Of course, they cannot predict the market, so not every fund is a good one. Um, some bonus things that you need to be aware of is precious metals, which is um, a commodity. So you have your silver, uh, bronze, gold, what have you. Um, cryptocurrencies, your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, things of that nature. So those are some side things you need to be aware of. Um, I would not get into the details of that because I each one could be its own episode. Now, not everyone wants to ride the market like a roller coaster, so you need to be understand risk tolerance levels that match your investment types that suit your comfort zone. And I'll get to that a little bit later. And then diversification. Don't put not putting all your eggs in one basket. So you can spread out your portfolio between stocks bonds, mutual funds, crypto, precious metals. Okay. Now the, uh, risk tolerance. So it's basically how much you want to take a chance on. Some of you are poker players. Some of you may be, you know, just rather have a, a smooth cruise sale. That's okay. So how do you gauge on that risk tolerance? Well, the best thing to do is ask yourself, are you a thrill seeker? Can you handle high risk for potential high reward? Or do you prefer stability and slower growth? Another tip is what's your financial safety net? Can you handle potential losses without financial turmoil? Or do you need to prioritize security? And the last thing you want to ask yourself is what's my investment timeline? Are you aiming for short term gains or building wealth for the long haul? So remember, there's no right or wrong answer. The key is to understand your unique comfort level and choosing investments that align with it. A financial advisor can also help you assess your risk tolerance and build personalized investment portfolio. Now, when it comes to diversification, again, it's not putting all your eggs in one basket. It's basically, it's like a, I think the best way to put it is like a wardrobe, you know, um, you don't wear the same outfit every day. So you have a diversification. Same thing. Same thing as in your closet where you have different types of, you know, whether it's shoes or clothing pieces, the same thing should be in your stock. In your, excuse me, in your portfolio. Some should be stock. Some should be bonds. Some should be mutual funds. Some should be even real estate. So, again, you need to think about these things. So, seek mentorship also. I have to stress that um, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Some are good. Some are not so good. I would say seek a professional financial advisor. That's what I used to be. And just learn from mistakes. You're going to make mistakes along the way. And that's okay. As long as you learn from it. Baby steps start small with micro investing apps like Robinhood or Stash or even Cash App. These platforms automate investments with spare change, making it easy and painless. Also, what you can do is do what's called paper money, where you sign up for a free investment. They'll uh, theoretically, and I'll say this uh, like Monopoly, they're going to give you Monopoly money and they're going to give you this money so you can use it to practice your investments in the real stock market. So I believe TD Ameritrade, uh, Charles Schwab, and some other companies that don't come to mind right now, but if you search for it, like paper money, there are softwares that they'll allow you to sign up for for free 
and you can actually practice some of the strategies on investments and with no risk. So you can try to really get your hands a little bit dirty on, on the stock market. Now, you need to know your risk tolerance. Going back, you, you want to treat these practices as if it's real life. You want to practice as if. So are you a thrill seeker or a cautious captain? Understand your comfort level with market fluctuations before choosing investments, before it goes up and down, things like that. And you want to seek mentorship. Don't be afraid to consult financial advisors or online resources for guidance. Learning from the pros can save you time and mistakes. And diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Spread your investment across different assets classes like stocks, bonds, real estate, even precious metals uh, to manage risk. Um, true story. When I was in uh, Merrill Lynch, I had a, I had this uh, one client, and he. This was right before the uh, the crash happened, and I diversified his portfolio based on his risk tolerance. So I had a certain amount of uh, stock, certain amount of bonds, and then I put precious metals, and I even did some overseas stuff. Guess what? When the market crashed, the all the stuff he diversified for stayed still. It was slightly down, but not so much. So I shouldn't say stay still, but that's besides the point. Um, he beat the market. As a matter of fact, I remember one particular investment we did was silver. We invested in silver. I think it was approximately, um, because it was around 2008, um, 2009, I think it was like $9, $10. It's right now at $22 from this recording. And... We also did some gold. It wasn't a lot of gold, but we did some. And around that time, it was around, I believe it was around 700 and change. Now it's at $2,000. Precious metal works. Another thing that I kind of wish I got into was Bitcoin when it was at the rise. I understood about cryptocurrency. I was just skeptical. Guess what? My risk tolerance was low with crypto. And, you know... I missed out on that opportunity, but that's, and that's the point of the game. You don't kick yourself. You just learn from mistakes. Should I invest it small? Absolutely. And that small investment would have been huge by then, but nevertheless, know your risk. Now I'm going to elaborate on micro investing that I mentioned earlier. So apps like Acorns and Stash, uh, let you invest spare change from everyday purchases making it practically invisible and painless roundup, uh, roundups that it, it, like your, your purchases, that whatever it's a latte or um, an Amazon purchase. You can round it up and you buy fractions of a share or stock. That in part will help you grow. It's called dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging meaning you, uh, you purchase at different prices, but it's always the same amount. So if it's like always, and I'm just rounding about number, if it's if you're always putting in a dollar and sometimes it's at 50 cents and sometimes that $2, then you, you're getting a decent average if you're always putting in that $1. That's called dollar cost averaging. So something to think about and look into more. Now, another thing you can do is set it or forget it. Your nest egg. Automate your micro investments and watch your little, um, no pun intended, your acorns blossom into mighty oaks uh, over time. Consistency is key, even with small amounts. Again, dollar cost averaging. When you enter the same amount of dollar, despite the price, you will see benefits. Also, another app you can do. Some apps, they allow you to gamify your growth. So it'll be a fun challenges, give you badges. I know a lot of crypto apps starting to do this. I'm not going to promote any of one in particular because I saw what happened to Matt Damon. And um, if you don't know what that is, I uh, it's due worth the Google. Just go on Matt Damon and crypto and I'm sure you'll get a couple of laughs. Um, but you want to track your progress, learn new things and feel the dopamine rush of seeing your portfolio inch upwards. 
So thinkers, we're about to conquer this market beast with a secret weapon. That's dollar cost averaging. It's not magical spell or anything of the sort. It, it's just as simple as I mentioned. Dollar cost averaging is, is autopilot. Taking the fear out of investing and making those dreaded market dips your best friend. So imagine throwing pebbles at a rock wall. Each pebble is a fixed amount of money. You invest at a regular interval, like clockwork. Sometimes the pebble bounces off the market, no, excuse me, the wall, which is market down, um, but you keep chucking them. That's that consistent investing. Over time, there'll be a crack in the wall, and then eventually it'll drop. The wall, that is. And that's your market kaboom. The point is you're not throwing all your rocks at once. Okay? You're, pay you're playing the long game, averaging out the ups and downs and building on solid foundations. And eventually, you'll be victorious. Another way of dollar cost averaging is when you, uh, if you have a retirement plan, uh, 401k or IRA or, and you have a fixed percentage of your paycheck go into retirement, that's dollar cost averaging because it's going into funds, whether it's mutual funds or stocks or what have you, whatever type of retirement you have, it's still dollar cost averaging. So you can look at it that way. So. Um, I know I'm harping on this, but I cannot stress the power of dollar cost averaging. Uh, don't try to time the market like a superhero trying to save the day. Dollar cost averaging takes away the emotions out of the equations and ensures you buy both in the high and the low. So it averages out. Uh, you don't, unless you plan on becoming a day trader or a swing trader. You do not have to worry about the market movement. So if you have a busy life and you have no intention of trying to be a day trader or a swing trader, then dollar cost averaging is your best friend because it goes bit by bit. And you don't have to fear that market. If the market crashes, guess what? You're still buying in. When, again, a quick story. When I was in Maryland, so after the crash happened, I had one particular client that put a ton of money. When I say a ton, it was millions of dollars into particular stocks. Citibank was one of them. And at the time, uh, off the top of my head, I believe Citibank was at $2. Um, it's no longer at $2. So th this, is where, this is where the rubber meets the road. Dollar cost averaging. He understood that it wasn't going to crash. Now, if you dollar cost average, you don't even have to worry about it because you're already buying in when those market dips happen. It's all about the long game. It's about being stable, stress-free, foundation for your financial future. Don't worry about the overnight riches that you hear, such as the Bitcoin thing, you know, that we heard years ago. Focus on consistent investing and let dollar cost averaging work it's magic now i'm not i know i'm down uh it sounds like i'm down in crypto let me be clear i do own crypto i love it i think it's great i think um everyone should participate in that as well three financial fortress essentials now for this one, you might hear some background noise because I have a special guest, and that is my two-year-old son. So he is in the studio with me. But that is not neither here or there. Let's get right into it. The Build Your Emergency Fund. Now, I kind of briefly mentioned it earlier, and I, I need you to, when you are building your fund, it is so important to aim for three to six months of living expenses. To whether unexpected bumps like a job loss or medical bills, what have you. You need to calculate them. Calculate all your monthly expenses. Multiply it by the amount of months. Three, to, three, three through six. So it could be three months. It could be four months, five months, six months. Depends on your situation. And uh, go from there. 
Now, you want to prioritize paying off high interest credit card debt with strategies like Snowball or Avalanche Method. Um, you also want to look into automating some of your finances, uh, set up automatic transfers to savings and investment accounts, make regular saving effortless. Um, that is your dollar cost averaging. You can dollar cost average your savings in a, in a way, but just in a fixed amount per month, you set it where it goes from your checking or your paycheck to your savings account. So this way you have a regular um, out of sight, out of mind, regular deposits. And I want to elaborate this um, when it comes to these emergency funds. Okay. Um, you want to always, always revisit your budget and financial goals because life evolves. And so you need to adjust yourself. And just like in a situation where you need um, stocked food, for a case of emergencies like no electricity or flooding or what have you, uh, it is important to have an emergency fund, a financial cushion to handle unexpected bumps like a job loss, uh, appliances breakdown, um, things in that nature. And you need to make sure it is secure so and easily accessible. You don't want, you know, if you have a fire in your, in your house, having the cash money in your, unless it's in a fireproof safe, having it uh, in your, under your pillow, under your mattress is maybe not a good idea. You know, I would say, you know, at best, maybe even keep it in a, in a fireproof safe. But that's not a, you know, that's besides the point. So let me give you an example. So Sarah earns 4000 monthly. Talked about Sarah before. Her emergency fund target is twelve to twenty-four thousand dollars. Wow, that's a lot, especially with all expenses. So how can she do that? Cutting back on non-essentials, reducing restaurant outings or subscriptions can free up extra cash. Selling unused items, turn clutter into cash through online marketplaces or garage sales. And then lastly, you want to automate transfers, set up the automatic monthly transfers uh, to your emergency fund to build it steadily. So you want to continue doing that. Now, debt. Think of debt as, you can look at it two ways. I'm going to focus more on the negative side uh, rather than the positive side. Um, you need to think of debt almost like a, uh, like vines, creeping around your financial castle because we've been talking about building this foundation, this strong house. And, you know, sometimes it could be good, sometimes it could be bad, but there's different ways to tackle some of the negative of debt. And one is the snowball effect. I mentioned this earlier, like just the name, but here's what it is. is list debts from smallest to largest. Pay off the smallest first, gaining momentum and motivation so you get that dopamine hit you knock out the small credit cards the small little debts the store cards whatever and you sh and i recommend you never use a store card unless it has a visa or mastercard logo um and just build from there you get those dopamine hits and at the same time as you free up the smaller credit cards and they become zero balance now you have extra funds to pay off the bigger debt and you continue down that path. Another is um, what's called the avalanche method. You prioritize debts from the highest interest rates first, saving money in the long run. Now this is for your long time, long term seekers. You want to make sure you're visualizing, you're keeping the, the eye on the prize on this one. It is fortuitous of you to do that um, but it's not um, it's not for everyone and then there's debt consolidation this is the popular one there's many companies that promote this you'll probably see it on um, those uh, the credit apps that you know check your credit score constantly they're always offering you debt consolidation if you have credit cards you know Consider consolidating multiple debts into one loan with a low, lower interest rate. It can work, 
but you have to get approved by the lower interest rate. So let me give you an example. Alex has $5,000 in credit card debt with 18% interest. He chooses the snowball method. Make uh, paying off his one thousand dollars student loan first, then chipping away on the credit card debt. Um, automating your defenses. So, imagine Century robots tirelessly patrolling your castle walls. That's the power of automation in your finance. You set it and you forget it. Set up automatic uh, automatic transfers to savings accounts building your emergency fund, retirement savings. So that's your 401ks, your 403bs. If you have an employer or if you're self-employed and you have a retirement account where it can take off, you know, before, after taxes, do that. Do that. That even if the employer doesn't really give you um, a significant like um, a percentage to match it, that's okay. It is an incentive for you. I think of it like a savings account. And also build future investment goals. So if you're trying to get into the stock market so you can get extra income, things in that nature, you want to separate that. Then there's bill payments. Avoid late fees. Ensure peace of mind. Make sure it's on a calendar. <laughs> Make sure it's on a calendar. And then there's debt repayment. Stick to your debt repayment plan without manual effort. So let me give you an example. Maria set up an automatic transfer of $200 to an emergency fund, $100 to her retirement account, and $300 towards her car loan payment each month. Um, there you go. That's $500, right? No, excuse me, $600 right there. Now, um, regular inspections and upgrades. So we're talking about that financial fortress it isn't set in uh, set in stone. You got to review your budget and goals and strategies regularly. Adapt to changing needs. Adjust spending habits. Explore new investment opportunities. So let me give you another example. Every six months, Sarah reviews her budget, adjusting for any changes in income or expenses. She also reaches new investment options to optimize her portfolio growth. Remember, thinkers. Building financial fortress is a journey, not a destination. These essentials are your tools, but the power lies in your commitment and continuous action brick by brick, step by step. That's your financial fortress, rising strong and secure, ready to weather any storm and hold your dreams. Don't hesitate to ask further questions or suggest specific areas uh, you like to delve deeper into. Building financial literacy together is our mission, and your input is what makes it meaningful and impactful. Let's keep the conversation going and empower each other to become masters of our own financial destinies. Remember, these, this, these are all just springboards. I'm encouraging you to personalize these strategies, share your experience, and ask questions. Build Your Financial Literacy is a community effort, and this podcast the thinking to think and the community can be um, the meeting point for your financial empowerment and your critical thinking. Thank you so much for listening. I know this was a really long one, but it was an important one. Normally, these type of lessons uh, takes years to master. And there are courses, uh, several courses on just one topic of the three that we went over And when it comes to finance. So having said that, like, share, subscribe, uh, make a comment. If you want more of these type of videos and talk about more finance, by all means, just let me know. I am more than happy to oblige. And my two-year-old and I, thank you. We appreciate you. And we love you dearly. All that listen. And we'll see you in the next one.